Hello and welcome tonight to our next Eager to Grow session. And um, tonight I have the pleasure to welcome with you my um, our panelists today that we have. We have here Dr. Sandra Wieland Dornbach and Dr. Irene Skubala. And also I have um, my wonderful co host Sofia Trojanovka here. And um, yeah, before I hand over to them, I would like um, to welcome all of you to our topic of tonight which is the future of education, a new passage for Europe. And um, yeah, before I um, hand over to, um, to Sophia, I would like to say um, welcome everyone to this talk. Um, together with net tech we are supporting women, female careers within STEM and digital business, but we also work together with companies and teams to really promote diversity and uh, yeah, I'm very curious to hear about the topic of education tonight. Myself, I think um, yeah, I'm a lifelong learner. Growth mindset is definitely my um, a passion and dear to my heart. So I'm very much looking forward to get to know everyone. And yeah, before we start with Sandra and Irene, I would say, Sophia, let's kick it off. I'm very curious um, to hear why the topic is so important for you. Well, thank you, Julia, for the invitation. Hello, Irena. Hello, Sandra. I'm so happy to have this talk with you. I think education is uh, at the core, especially after or during COVID now. We have a big, big switch uh, into digital uh, capacities. And I'm really curious to understand better through the eyes of our experts today, how education has uh, shifted and how it has uh, developed uh, during and now after the pandemic soon and uh, maybe the trends and also best practices in Europe, which uh, you can kind of report. And yeah, being also a long life learner, um, I it's close to my heart as well. And I hope that we have more and more and better opportunities uh, worldwide for education. So I'm giving it uh, up to uh, Sandra. Uh, please uh, invite, um, yeah, please describe your experience and um, yeah, who are you basically? Thank you so much, Sophia. Thank you so much, Julia, for being here. Um, yeah, so why I'm here and who I am, my deep interest is um, to unlock the potential of individuals and teams. And um, this is a heartfelt purpose I follow and I, I, I'm committed to for almost 20 years in different roles and in different uh, um, environments. Um, I just love to enable and empower individuals and teams um, to be high performing. I have to commit. <laughs> Uh, because I truly care about the impact, but I also truly care about the, st the s sustainability of um, social interactions in teams and also individuals. So really, this is in the core of what I am doing to empower high performance uh, in a sustainable way. Um, and I have a deep-rooted um, background in coaching, business, as well as in, I would say, uh, the science of logical reasoning, which is mathematics. <laughs> so um, I truly love to engage uh, also, you know, with people um, uh, uh, on, on, you know, two logical, mindful uh, thought processes. I am a mother of three. Um, that triggers me also to, um, to be interested in how education nowadays is offered to youth. Um, and this also made, made up a decision of mine um, to engage in an initiative where we, uh, where we educate um, young people in coding. I give it over to Irene. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you, Sophia and Julia, for the great um, introduction and the invite for today. So my name is Irene and I'm a psychologist by training uh, with a focus on e-learning and teaching. And to be honest, after graduating from school, I never ever wanted uh, to deal with teaching, school learning um, again, um, and certainly not with teaching. But I was always attracted to technologies that could make learning experiences easier, more fun and more transparent. And that's why I started a career in um, educational psychology um, I did research um, on e-learning using also different kind of learner variables, such as, for instance, eye tracking to measure attention 
and how we can combine uh, materials in such a way that they promote learning. So I worked in different countries, um, I did research, I did teaching, and at the same time, I was always shocked to see how our educational system is lagging behind innovation. And I still don't understand why students these days still have to carry these super heavy books to school. Um, but I also don't see how school publishers can think sometimes that just putting a book into PDF makes it e-learning. So um, I'm very much interested and driven by the idea to bridging this gap and making learning more fun and um, more um, adaptable, adaptive to learners' needs. Wow, I mean, this uh, these are very interesting topics. Uh, for example, like coding and uh, that uh, Sandra is uh, covering uh, with coding design and also in her professional life, but also with Irena, who is uh, interested in e-learning. So my first question would be, like, what are the big trends that you are now perceiving in education? And um, yeah, how maybe is Europe and Germany reacting onto those trends? Are we are uh, are we are leaders here, or are we laggers? Uh, yeah, what is what is the status quo in Europe and in Germany, Sandra? I hope Irena will uh, also contribute to this, as uh, as currently I have a focus on what's going on in Germany. Um, so first of all, the big three trends I see is um, is that number one, teaching um, digital literacy uh, is has to has to, uh, will go more the, um, through project based teamwork, and this is also this is actually true um, for um, you know for young people as well as for adults. Uh, because here you combine the collaboration um, uh, um, and 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 in uh, in the teamwork as well with uh, getting uh, to know the 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 digital background which is needed to uh, to actually implement a project. Yeah, so it's kind of you learn on the way while uh, collaborating um, on a given project or on a selected project by yourself with a team. So this is number one. Um, number two is, for me, it's like the giving the opportunity to take ownership and to experience self-efficacy in an unknown environment. It's not to tell how, how one should learn, but it's uh, more to inspire why one should learn and then encouraging and uh, and and um, giving the ownership to the learner um, what to acquire, what knowledge needs to be acquired in order to actually um, not achieve mastery. This is not about perfection. It's about curiosity-driven learning. Yeah? You, it matters to you, so you st you so you um, take ownership of the learning journey. Um, so that means that teachers become more creator of the learning environment, but the learning actually is uh, is uh, um, is is driven uh, by the learner himself. And number three, it's um, yeah to stay open. What kind of new ways of learning will pop up? We don't know. Um, it might be you know it's more of a peer to peer teaching. Um, so not so really like to remain open and um, to stay curious um, what new ways of learning will actually be needed in the future. I think this is essential. Um, so I, the third bucket I would leave open <laughs> as a placeholder. Yeah. But not, but we really like the team based working number one and and uh, the curiosity driven uh, learning approaches um, are the big biggest two trends I see. That's super interesting. So um, how does it uh, melt into e-learning, Irina, when you think about, you know, uh, learning by doing and also by curiosity yeah. and engaging with new technology? Because, I mean, I went to uh, like a usual public school here in Germany and uh, it was like book based, like uh, in the front mm -hmm. there was the teacher, everything like mm -hmm. quite and digital and a couple of years back i called my old school and i said hey guys do you have some investment into computers and you know digital programs yeah we have some maybe in the next two years and i was, yeah. this was 20, 2080 yeah. 18 and now it's 2021 so 
I'm wondering myself, okay, did they did they kind of, you know, emerge? Um, and how how is the schooling here in Germany or in Europe going? Is it like that open-minded or progressive? Or can we actually invest more? Yeah, we can invest more, no question. And I mean, um, it's not a big surprise when I tell you that um, it's even in the data, empirical evidence is there. When it comes to digitization, uh, Germany is, um, I think, on the last rank uh, within Europe. Um, and on top, we have Estonia and Finland, I believe. Um, so, um, yeah, we need more investments, but it's not just the investment. So, um, because um, the government is spending or like it's um, providing money for digitalization in schools, but the schools themselves have to come up with a concept and ask for the money. And there seems to be some kind of a barrier, I don't know, with the, like doing the concept or uh, asking for the money, but the like a huge amount of this money um, is still lying there untouched. And that's why we still don't have laptops in schools. We don't even have internet. In many schools, they don't even have um, a teacher email address. So I know that in the beginning, some teachers were using Gmail, which is of course against the data protection law. So they had to stop that. Um, um, at the same time, so they had no email contact to um, to parents or, or students. Um, and I believe in many cases they use data protection law as some kind of a lame excuse why progress is not happening. Uh, but what Corona has shown us, and I think it was more or less like a magnifying glass, is that we are really lagging behind and we have to do something about it. We can't wait hoping that Corona will um, soon be over and we can... Um, you know, like return to old good days, because it's not the case. And also, we uh, we always we owe it to other students. The students have to be prepared for a um, digitalized workplace, and that's not what's happening right now in schools. Um, and and when you touch the thing about um, you know interactivity and um, collaboration um, and how it transfers into the digital world, so what I can say is. Um, E-learning doesn't mean at the same time that everything is perfect because I know many e-learning programs that are just frontal. So the learner sits in front of the session and, it, you know, like it's passive learning. You just sit there and you click, click, click. And at the end, there might be a small test, multiple choice, and then it's transferred and you receive, okay, cool, you, um, you pass the test, you pass the session. That's not active learning at all, right? Needless to say. So, um, Speaking of the trends, I believe we can use these days technologies and also learning analytics to make e-learning more engaging and tailor it to the learner's needs. At the same time, make it more interactive because that's also what Sandra was talking about, right? Um, the future skills will also be social skills. Um, it's not just that you know things about the world, you also have to apply it in a social interactive um, context. Because what we can see is that the routine work in the workforce or workplace will go down while at the same time interactive routine will go up and that's why you need all the social skills which you have to um, acquire during learning of course and may i also contribute to this um it's there is no blueprint of how you do this right and um as you said irene it's like this that the uh, institutions who um those who make up the education system they need to digitally transform themselves and at the same time, provide mm -hmm. services that fit, uh, mm -hmm. that make fit for the future. So, and my approach is start, um, start uh, really um, to digitalize your organization. While doing this, you better understand how you, you know, what kind of services are needed to educate the people, uh, you know, who are you know, either who, who are in your company um, or you or who you are in your school system. So I think it's it's like when I come to a firm and they ask me, okay, please upskill our, you know, our, um, our workforce. Um, then what I start also uh, challenging is, uh, do you have the actual cultural foundation? Mm. Yeah, that this effort, that this, you know, investment, I'm happy to do this, of course, to make money, but um, to make sure that the investment is also is also providing return. Um, and so, which means not, it's not only about the programs them, the, themselves, it's also about the cultural foundation, uh, building a learning and development um, uh, um, uh, positive environment, where making mistakes is actually, where people dare to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. 
um, and uh, step up and learn, you know, and uh, and and put themselves in a vulnerable position, admitting that they have made mistakes and what you know and what what uh, and what they've taken out of it. Yeah, it's, it's like really to to change the culture um, as a as a as someone um, who is strategically in charge or to change the culture for the leaders of learning um, and for the institutions that, that, that they lead. I think this is super important. Otherwise it's, you know, they, they just come up with some ad hoc solutions, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which, which, which will not provide actually the impact which is needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point. A positive learning culture is so important and it shouldn't start in companies only but it already should start in schools so like, like kids learn that, you know, you need a specific positive attitude towards um, learning. And it can be so much fun, actually, because when you have a uh, learning, uh, a positive learning experience, you learn something, all these hormones kick in. Right. So, so basically there is a relationship between um, positive learning experiences and dopamine, for instance. Um, and it would be so great if kids wouldn't have, you know, anxiety or fear, failure and mistakes and errors. But, you know, like, OK, you fail. It's fine. You know, you can still continue and you can learn from it and you can improve it in the next step because that's how innovation happens. Right. If we could just apply such a um, <clears throat> mindset in our schools and teach it to our kids, we wouldn't probably have such big problems with um, culture, uh, learning culture in, in companies. Because like Sandra said, like sometimes they, they notice, oh, OK, our people need to learn something. We, we have some deficits here. So we we get someone into the company, they have to fix it and then they disappear. But that's not a learning culture. And um, um, Sandra, sorry, yeah. just um, we're wondering, did you see a shift even before COVID um, happened that companies were more open really to to invest? time and money of course into the learning um on the comp like within companies or would you say well COVID was really the situation that shook them awake and thinking okay we now need to go digitally anyway um and, and we need to upskill I think the uh, the urgency uh, was not strategically seen as as important as other as um, other things. Yeah, so that definitely shifted, and um, I think it was like you know what would have happened in I don't know the next five years, ten years, is now happening in a year or two. Yeah, which is good, uh, which is really good. Um, so I think they are more open. So they, they in order to make up for trainings, which couldn't take place uh, uh, um, in presence anymore, they, you know, um, adapted quickly to any kind of solutions uh, um, uh, like, uh, you know, like people like me uh, offered them um, and the quality um, really like, uh, so the co-creation of these online programs uh, um, was, was very fruitful on both ends. Yeah, so we learn together, and this is also, you know, uh, a way of how I think we should tackle issue. Uh, we should tackle problems, like to say we don't know the solution lasting for five, for you know, and uh, for, for the next five years. But let's start, you know, co-create the best possible solution now. Let's test it, and let's also adapt it. So I think the the this, you know, stay humble. This is one of my favorite. Uh, you know, um, um, favorite uh, character characteristics of a leader, yeah, which makes it possible actually to listen also to other people's perspective, yeah, not overestimating the value of your own thoughts, um, but really like to 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 to, to uh, nail a challenge to ask people to invite people to co-create solutions and to think about it um, and then stay open and uh, be ready to adapt this solution um, and and this is something i have seen um, that companies are more willing um, to to test uh, um, to pilot things yeah which they wouldn't have piloted uh, um, before COVID, and now they're ready to do it, and then to see to evaluate, you know, what the impact is, um, and then um, you know gradually change their existing programs. 
Understood. The thing is, what I I found very interesting uh, during my research about new trends in uh, in um, education was personalization. So we all know mm -hmm. Amazon with uh, personal recommendations. Okay, what's next? What do you can buy? <laughs> and actually, I'm uh, taking like a French class via Bump Bubble, and um, I'm noticing that there is an engine behind that kind of gets my um, learning pace and my whole learning uh, adventure, as to say, my goals. And it is like really interesting that it kind of uh, motivates me on a daily basis to take those 15 minutes to train the language. And I was asking myself, is this already present in, uh, you know, trainings for, you know, uh, employees or for, for children at school? And um, is this already there? Or is it only like this tiny app that I just by chance have and that kind of gives me this personalization? Because I guess uh, this, this could be also something really cool uh, in the future as a digital, you know, uh, advantage over you know, uh, usual uh, schooling, because a teacher cannot, you know, personalization from a teacher, I'm happy if he knows my name or she, you know, so he <laughs> knows a little bit maybe of my character, but I cannot, um, you know, I cannot anticipate or like uh, I require him to know exactly my pace. So uh, where do you see like opportunities here? Maybe Sandra first and Irene second. Um, I think there is, um, big room for improvement, but this is exactly the I think the way going forward. Because my my so my idea my ideal uh, way of learning would be that you tap into the intrinsic motivation of learners and teachers, um, and to tap and to be able to tap into the intrinsic motivation, you need to find the sweet spot where you can actually match um, the pre-existing uh, um, capabilities and interests with um with the right degree of challenge to be exposed to yeah that stimulates i mean we know that you know not knowing something uh, if you start something new not knowing anything about it is then hard to know to kick to quick start learning process but if you know a little bit and then the right degree of challenge uh, also um um met it's taken into account your your type of learner uh then you know pushes you forward yeah, and uh, intrinsically motivates you to stay curious and to motivate yourself. And then you don't need, um, so it's actually an, an artificial intelligence who is, uh, who is like leading the learning journey or the learning journey uh, or, you, or, um, or making up for your learning experience. This, there is a lot of things, there is a lot of room for improvement, but that would be perfect uh, for adults as well as for children. Yeah, so this taps actually to one of the trends, uh, current trends right now. It's called learning analytics. And that means um, that you as a learner, you receive personalized learning and teaching um, through customization of learning paths and content. But it also requires that your um, information, your um, behavioral data is being stored um, and processed, right? So the more data you have from, I don't know, like more, more learners, you can... Um, um, come up with some profiles, um, and then you have, um, as Sandra mentioned, um, artificial intelligence kicking in. Um, you also need some data scientists, of course, um, who will probably program the first algorithms, and then, you know, the more data you collect, uh, the smarter the system gets, and it can customize and tailor um, contents towards on the learner's needs. Um, so far, I don't see that in the school systems because of data protection. Again, you're not allowed to collect data. Um, in the in the field of um, employer of employees, um, so we have learning management systems in many companies. Again, you're not allowed to store data because of data protection, and you have then the workers' union. Um, they would probably forbid it. Um, so there are many um, arguments not to do so. However, um, I believe that there will be a way where we can um, compromise, not violating um, data protection at the same time, collect data and make really smart learning systems, because actually that's the future of it. What we have currently is if you, for instance, decide now to, to learn French and you said you, you learn it with a specific app, you as a learner, you will probably um, have to do your own search, right? You, you have to try different apps because there is a huge um, range of different apps and offerings, and you must make a decision based on your specific interest. Wouldn't it be so cool to have a system where you just, you know, like 
type in or that already knows you and your habits and can um, recommend a specific app or tool um, or seminar to you. And, and that's probably where we are now moving towards. So there is now, um, there are some, some research projects currently running where they will develop such um, analytics um, and integrate it into the learning systems. Because currently we have really great offerings such as Coursera, for instance, uh, Khan Academy, but you as a learner, you still have to make your decision and you don't know which one fits your um, needs best. And it's currently, a, yeah, it's definitely a trend, um, customizing um, the learning path, making the learner in control um, of the whole learning experience. Yeah, but at the expense of a community, for example. So, for example, um, I also took like a course once at Columbia University, which was completely digital. It was back yeah. in 2018. And it was quite progressive at this time because it kind of connected all the executives from many countries according to the time zones. And I was able to uh, yeah travel and actually solve capstone assignments with people from South Africa, from Switzerland, from Italy at the same same time which I thought like back then wow it's quite progressive and now mm -hmm. here we are so um, I can imagine okay fair point with the app I'm completely happy because I'm independent I can whenever I have time 15 minutes on the train somewhere else uh, dig into uh, like this learning experience but at the expense of community so how what do you think how important is community for learning mm -hmm. actually uh, it is actually very important, and that's probably one of the um, of, uh, that's another trend that we have. Um, it's soft skills like social and emotional skills and empathy, which you can only, of course, train and learn in a community. Um, so there is like just a brief anecdote um, that I um, from my uh, work in Freiburg. So there was a time when there were some recordings of the lectures, and some students decided to just to watch the lectures instead of going to the lectures itself, right? Uh, and some professors were like arguing, oh man, these lazy students, they, they don't come to the lectures. Instead, you know, they just watch the recordings. And I was thinking to myself, no, they are so, so smart. Because just doing the recording for themselves, and it, um, A, it was not much different than the lecture that they would experience in the lecture hall, because it was just frontal and it was not interactive. B, doing it uh, at home, they could just decide when they would learn. Um, they could skip the redundant information. They could make a, their own decision uh, when they would make a pause and, you know, dig deeper into specific contents. So they practice self-regulated learning at its best. And instead, you know, like the whole system is so old fashioned. Why do we waste highly educated lecturers who preach more or less the same stuff semester after semester to a group of students in a lecture hall noisy, no AC and so on. Instead, let people do the recordings on themselves, but use the space in the classroom, in the lecture hall for interactions, for community. That's the, the, you know, the aspect that you mentioned. Why not working the, you know, the precious time that you have with other human beings as a um, interactive um, learning, making a, an interactive learning experience where people can, um, in addition to their contents, do something useful, like social, emotional, not just passive listening, but I don't know, like working on case studies and um, apply knowledge and transfer knowledge, um, discuss interesting questions, uh, Q&As with the professor instead of just listening. And that's a community aspect. So, I mean, there were many methods such as, you know, flip classroom and so on, but it, um, it needs the lecturers, the educators to, um, to do it, to practice it. And uh, there are some 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 good examples where during Corona, for instance, uh, thinking about uh, this, uh, the homeschooling of my kids, they started exactly this flip classroom. So they so they actually gave like uh, um, tasks to study at home um, on them. So, you know. Um, like peer to peer with you know someone from the uh, someone um, out of the um, out of the uh, group of peers um, or you know self study and then only used uh, a video session once you know um, an, uh, um, like an hour per day to discuss what they have learned and questions they had. So I but now it's it's gone. <laughs> they go back to the old school system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. I know from you know from the experience my my uh, my kids had this th that they said this is so much more efficient, mom, because then we really you know everyone can do it at, at, as at his or own uh, pace and then uh, and do 
at, at the time, which is most suitable for, for me as a learner. Uh, you know, some people work better in the morning, some better in the evening. Um, and then we go, you know, prepare to the classroom and exchange. Yeah. And so in all my programs I do for companies, I do the same. So there was there was a list of pre-reading, there was um, a list of pre-recorded uh, sessions. Um, where you ask the trainees to uh, to to dive into them, and then when we actually um, have the training, we only do um, you know team uh, team so team engagements. So um, work in breakout rooms uh, as a team, working on uh, some challenges. So I think this this is being incorporated, but not full fledged and not everywhere. We do it also at, uh, like uh, in our in our coded design camps. Um, the teams work on their projects, and then if some individual uh, thinks that he or she needs to uh, get on speed with a certain with a certain uh, piece of you know knowledge when it comes to software development, etc., uh, she he or she can go to uh, to um, to a classroom. Um, where there, you know, is someone um, giving an, in, an intro course um, or a immediate course, and then they go back to the teamwork. So it's it's not everyone is forced to do it, but depending on the level and depending on the maturity. So I think this is super super important that this gets more embedded in all kind of learning experiences. But I see some good examples. This was my this was my point here. Nice. Sounds cool. Um, also, like what I hear from uh, your accounts is basically that there uh, will be, yeah, there are opportunities for online. But for example, at school, we will go back to you know the usual school system. But actually, isn't it better to have like such a blended, um, blended uh, opportunity where you have like online and offline opportunities? And how feasible is this? For example, first at schools and then for um, maybe also universities and uh, companies? Maybe Sandra first. It is very feasible. It's just, it really depends on like, uh, you know, what are people willing um, to, to, to establish as a new norm, yeah? I think to incorporate, uh, you know, like to make learning like a fun and efficient experience um for the learners um um and to try out new ways uh, of of concepts and not and not not to think that uh you know because the pandemic situation uh is is uh, is now at ease that everyone can go back to normal this is this is just you know this this is the biggest danger <laughs> i'd say that they that that they don't the, you know what has been possible during these days uh um, should be incorporated really like like more into the learning system at uh, on a broader scale so there are companies uh, who have uh, who who who, uh, who understood um, schools have not understood uh, for sure they go back to to the old ways mm -hmm. um, and um, universities I don't know maybe arena you know better whether universities actually um, keep keep doing this blended versions. <laughs> Uh, no, uh, so to my knowledge, most of them are, um, it's not an online uh, study program. They are going back to the classrooms, actually. But I mean, it's okay to go back to the classrooms if you do it, as you already mentioned, Sophia, a blended way, right? But again, like it requires some additional efforts because in the beginning you have to come up with these recordings. Sandra said, so for instance, she sends to her clients some recordings. And you have to prepare them, right? So probably, Sandra, you know, you prepare your recordings, you prepare your materials, then you send it to your clients. And then in the meetings, you um, work on it, like you have probably Q&As and you, um, I don't know, like you relate to the material that you send them before. Mm -hmm. So this requires preparation and having a learning goal and um, I, I wish we would um, we would teach at universities this way um, soonish, uh, but um, I would say especially on the universities like the presence universities, they will go back to normal. And because I don't know for some reason people believe that going back to normal is better. Back to normal is um, you know like going back to better, um, as if the current solutions that we um, um, worked out are, are bad. Um, and I wish that we will keep some of these new solutions because they do work uh, better for students, for, um, 
they do allow uh, for better um, individualized um, learning paths. At the same time, we, sh we, we must consider that not everything can be digitalized or should be digitalized because the human beings, especially young students who move to a totally new city, need the human contacts, right? And the social um, environment, because being in your early 20s, um, you learn so much, not only on a cognitive level, but also on an emotional and social level, and that you can only do with other students. Um, so um, I agree with you, the blended format would probably work best. Um, but again, it takes some time and some effort. And I fear that some people are not um, willing to invest, especially when, and that's probably a problem of our German system, um, teachers and um, professors at universities are quite safe, you know, like it's public servants, um, um, they have safe jobs um, and you cannot force them to do um, certain things um, because we still have this kind of freedom in teaching, freedom in um, lecturing. Um, yeah, but well, let's hope. Well, we should evaluate our learning uh, um, our learning system more that's uh, so mm -hmm. I really like see okay what's what is the measurable impact um, mm -hmm. you know that, that you know you, um, that you that that people have when when they have done a semester at university at school and so on I think it's it is a mind shift yeah it's to say we like it's it's you know um, saying I I don't say that the teachers uh, and universities and university professors are not driven by uh, by you know um, by stimulating um, impactful learning. I'm just saying that they have to go that they have to adapt to a different way of individualized uh, learning experience. Um, yeah, that people have experienced uh, in different ways. Um, and they had, and they have to, you know, offer something which is, um, which is, which is, you know, that that, that they have to open up um, themselves for different ways of learning, and then people should measure like what is the impact and how and how much did they enjoy the learning experience. Uh, and and I don't I don't mm -hmm. think that there is a big that, that there is an enjoyable way that if you you know be in a big um, a room where a hundred people sit and listen to a professor writing uh, um, writing uh, some notes uh, on a board. I don't I don't see this that this actually stimulates um, a good experience of learning. And if and if they and if they get evaluated and measured. Uh, by evaluations, then they have to change. Then they have to rethink the way they present. So so actually, um, we do have these kind of evaluations in, in universities. Um, so uh, you know, at the end of the semester, in you as a student being asked to evaluate the lecture. Uh, but the problem is, it's at the end of the lecture. So after like I don't know more than ten sessions. Um, which is actually a waste of time because you should make such an evaluation in between and give also the educator, the, the lecturer, a, um, a chance to change something in between. Um, and these evaluations are quite important for those who are still qualifying for a professorship because they can put it in their CVs. Look, I, I did some teaching and I was uh, evaluated like this and that. But then on the other hand, there are those um, professors with a W3 um, professorship. They are safe, even though they suck in teaching. <laughs> Um, you know, like their salary, their position is not um, performance based anymore. Um, that's the privilege of being uh, of the German Beamtentum. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, maybe we should go back to this kind of performance based, um, I don't know, incentives and, and come up with some new incentives. It would be great. And I think it would be it would benefit the students. Yeah, really, really interesting discussion that you that you have about it. And um, I remember with Netrotech we had a session, a 60-minute session, maybe a month ago actually, with uh, one of our role models, Dr. Professor Dr. Sui Winkel, who is um, also a professor in psychology um, in Germany, and she has she came up with the so-called "all you can learn" buffet. Um, I don't know if you have uh, met her. She's super active on LinkedIn as well. Um, and 
what she did was basically to offer all her students any sort of blended learning. They have the, the, the digital classroom world at the moment, of course, but everything is recorded. They have um, the books um, delivered in, in audio books and as well in podcasts. But there she also sets on the power of communities. So different students actually recorded the, the audio books. Mm, wow, that's um, nice different contests where the, the students can come up with, with different ideas. And what was interesting also that she did say she got a lot of, well, positive feedback as well from the students, but she also got a lot of quite some criticism from her colleagues to say, why are you so modern and interactive and, and do mm -hmm. different things? Like, because they felt, mm, well, I don't want to, right? And I also said, I asked her how, how to what extent can you share it with other professors? And she said, well, of course I can share it, but they can use it. But it's a question, do they want to use it? That's the um, the other thing, because of course it's the unknown, it's out of your comfort zone and be different. Um, uh -huh. So we had a really interesting session. And um, fitting to this actually, we have one uh, comment on uh, our YouTube channel from uh, Anna who said a major drawback in fostering innovation and creativity in universities is the high load um, of administrative tasks, bureaucratic structures and working conditions for professors. Mm -hmm. um, that's definitely a drawback. But on the other hand, as you said, um, and I guess, um, and I commented it uh, while Sandra was speaking, that it is a learning system, right? And then everyone learns. And that mental shift, I guess, needs to happen not only just in companies but also um at the universities at the schools um starting probably now in universities teaching young students who want to become the next teachers right mm -hmm. what are different ways of of learning how to use a whiteboard digitally right um, whether it's any sort of myro mural kahoot like whatever there is right but there are different different ways of gamification as well um so, and to make the loop, I was actually wondering, do, do you ladies have experience with hackathons and how learning and, and coming up with something new um, would end up? What is your, your opinion about hackathons? I think we have an expert here, Sandra. I I truly love hackathons. So I have done them twice now with young uh, for young people. Um, never done them before, um, also not as, as, a, as a participant. I truly think that, that this is a melting point of learning so many different, uh, different skills at the same time. Um, so social skills, definitely you need to collaborate, you need to team up, you need to, um, the way we do the hackathons, uh, we have a very broad, uh, um, we have a diverse um, set of young people with super different social background, um, gender, uh, um, nationality, etc. So we, you know, on the way while teaming up, you need to also have empathy. Yeah, you need to have, you know, the skills needed uh, to actually um, um, come in, work, come in, you know, to actually kickstart the teamwork. Um, then um, you learn on the way the, um, the, you know, how to how to master the digital um, collaboration tools because we do them online. Uh, we do them some of them as you know young as some of the young people don't have a laptop. We provide. Um, they do meet up um, in person um, due to uh, Corona. We had you know groups of five, um, so we had a hybrid setup of people meeting uh, actually uh, in, um, at a physical meetup, others um, joining online. Um, we had the overarching setup of the online um, hackathon where people could reach out to experts, tech experts or team experts uh, who, who were present online. So we created this learning experience, yeah. Um, of uh, where we had on the one hand side uh, truly engaged of um, tech coaches, team coaches, um, and on the other side, diverse set of young people, either you know um, physically or online from home. Um, over the course of three, four days, they do learn um, what is relevant for them, what they need in to, uh, to actually implement the product idea. 
they came up with. So this is, I think, a role, uh, like, like a, wish, a showcase of um, intrinsic motivation, self, uh, of intrinsic motivation, of, um, uh, of self-directed learning. You come up with an idea you want to do, whether it's, you know, uh, some, some that's a school website, very, very basic, but, it's, but it doesn't matter at whatever level they start, right? Whether like a, uh, like a, like a school um, website or a family app or um, AI controlled um, small toy cars, um, they came up with the ideas and they asked relevant questions. Um, the experts uh, helped them, guided them, uh, but didn't solve the problems, but just guide their learning uh, um, way um, how to, you know, what, what like what they could do next. Um, and then they were so proud to see, like on this, on, on, like on the last day, to show whatever they were they have been able to do over the course of three or four days. So it was, uh, you know, that they experienced self-efficacy, that they experienced, I take ownership of my learning experience, of my project, and I actually make it happen together with the team, with the assistance of tech coaches and team coaches. Um, and, you know, it, it, it didn't matter whether on the way they, they, you know, they made mistakes and at the final presentation they made mistakes. It was all part of, part of the learning. Um, and I think this this way, it would be for me, a, you know, a dream to do more of this in companies. Yeah, really. Um, the, it's it's all there. People are born with this intrinsic uh, a curiosity, and 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 with the vulnerability uh, um, to make mistakes and not and, and and not and not being ashamed of making mistakes. Yeah, it's it's all there, and I want, I want actually to create to create and uh, to create that learning env um, environment for adults as well, because otherwise I don't see how they can participate in uh, in in actively contributing to our to, to our digital future. I don't see it. Yeah, if you don't go out of your comfort zone, doing things, uh, in a, you know, like e e exposing yourself to this learning experience. Um, you know, things things uh, will be you know out of your control in five years, and you can't. You only you will only be consumer, but you do not understand what's going on. Mm, how feasible is it actually? I mean, it, this sounds like amazing. I also like the I also like the passion that you have behind it, and the motivation. How feasible is this to implement in schools like uh, that? Um, like. Uh, once a month there is such a hackathon in the school per school in germany for example well first of all you have to take out a lot of uh, um, curriculum which they have to do it's like you know it's it's, it's like uh, in companies a micromanager who has a plan written out for the next time of year people have to work upon yeah if you can um, a bad leader is someone who controls things and uh, and in schools learning learning is controlled like there is a curriculum uh, you need you know there's a certain amount of stuff you need to get through uh, our children's mind over the course of a year. So first is, you know, to make it lighter. Second is to do more of the project-based uh, um, learning style. Uh, you know, I think schools um, do it very open, you know, um, very often a week before a summer break, a week before, you know, uh, some vacation coming up. But um, yeah, I mean, um, for them, it's also it, it it's it's you know it's uh, it, it it takes also teachers who are willing to lean into that. Um, I mean, of course, it can be provided by others, um, but I think teachers are role are still role models, yeah. And if they you know uh, make themselves uh, expose themselves to these kind of uh, experiences. Um, that would be of great help uh, to show students. Okay, you see, I'm I'm actually I, I'm actually participating in a hackathon myself because I want to learn. Um, I think this this is also needed um, to have support from teachers. And um, thinking about this, Sandra, you mentioned uh, teachers should be great role models. Who um, would be a role model for for you? 
Do you have any role model in mind that you think, okay, in terms of learning, this person is a true role model for me? I don't have one <laughs> right away, but not, but we just, you know, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't closely looked, I haven't looked into possible role models, but just out, out of my head, you know, I don't have one. Irene, do you have a role model when it comes to teaching at school? Um, no, not one specific role model. It's usually, um, I don't know, like that I see something and someone like, oh, that's really cool. And I like this aspect. Um, and then from another person, oh, I like, you know, how how cool he is in talking to students. And um, from the other one, how she likes to, um, how, how good she is in setting her boundaries, which is also really great. And from another person, how spontaneous he is and um, in explaining very complex things. So I would say it's more like a mixture instead of one specific person that, um, has all the different features of a great role model. Yeah, I actually can contribute to this question. Like when I, and this is actually a little bit funny, but my, uh, yeah, my um, first year school teacher, my, uh, yeah, Grundschullehrerin, she was like amazing. She, her, her name was Frau Löwe and she was like a lion. <laughs> <laughs> she was like super I mean uh, she had like 20 small kids there and they were all like you know uh, screaming around and she managed to get them aligned and get things done and um, but in a friendly and sympathetic way and actually I got the feedback that it's actually this the the teachers and professors that you have throughout the life that inspire you to become some kind of character and uh, to to uh, enjoy some kind of learning journey and to kind of have some kind of a relation to education and she managed with i think most of them because i i'm still in touch with my uh, with the pupils from there to kind of uh, get like a, um, a link for us to education that makes us passionate about it so uh, I know from everyone that uh, went into university, into science, into like really becoming super taekwondo, uh, um, yeah, sportsman. The other one is, is still playing the violin and stuff like that. So um, she uh, had like this, um, this, this, she provided the access. And so for me, mm -hmm. she is my, my personal um role model <laughs> i don't know uh, whether it's okay to say that but i think uh, the the teachers can be like quite role models mm -hmm. here no? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. education can be a huge um, enormous power tool um just you know like you you can um i don't know like boost people and their careers but at the same time you can crash them and um i, I you know like teachers should be quite aware of it um and this is something very important, Irene. Um, there was, you know, in my coaching practice, um, and I have really done plenty of coaching hours, uh, still um, coaches do remember uh, what teachers have told them, what made them small. Mm -hmm. Diminishing really them like you will never, you will never understand math, right? And, you know, this is, this is, I mean, say, oh, come on, this is 20 years ago. Why, why do you still remember? But it, 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 I mean, we are, you know, made as, so the experiences, and I don't have to tell you as you're a psychologist, but just like, like stays with people. And I think therefore people who role model a growth mindset. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and who stimulate a growth uh, and who keep that growth mindset active uh who nourish that growth mindset in other people um is is super super important this is important to because other because it, it helps it to, to to stay strong and resilient no matter what comes and we don't know what you know what will be what 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 will be next challenging us after covid yeah uh we don't know um so to nourish and to um and to cultivate that growth mindset is super super important um, for us humans, um, and and this, you know, in any way should should be more of a holistic approach of good teachers, uh, who, who who I would call role models. Mm -hmm. That they're not only experts in what they do, yeah, um, but uh, more of a general, you know, more in a general way, in more in a holistic way to understand what makes us 
uh, humans uh, who will who are able or who become able to navigate in a complex today's world. Yeah, and this is not only knowing things. It's only it's also um, you know. Um, how to manage yourself, how to cope with emotions, um, how to um, how to strengthen your mind, uh, everything. So it should be really more of a holistic approach. What I would love to see in school in schools happening, mm -hmm. because we cannot because this is the education in the system has not to make up for default for, for, for like things which um, students don't learn at home but have to have to support what they ideally learn at home yeah mm. and um, I think this this then if I see a person if uh, if I if I see a teacher who is tapping into this more of a holistic um, um, uh, scope of uh, education then I would probably call her a role model. Okay, uh, maybe like um, one more question from my side. What kind of a school subject is missing? Is there something which you can say, okay, this is definitely missing in the curriculum and for this we can toss something else. So is there mm -hmm. something which you say, okay, for future proving my children or uh, the next generations, we definitely need this subject in the future? Digital literacy information mm -hmm. literacy media literacy 20 i would say you know um any kind of tech digital literacy should be incorporated next to math next to next to languages and data literacy because uh, this will be a key skill now for the near future um i believe in the near future you won't be able to lead a company without any data literacy skills and it's not so much about um, knowing how to do a cluster analysis, but more about to understand data, how you can manipulate specific graphics and so on. Because if you don't understand data, you cannot make data informed decisions for a company or for other people. Um, but, you know, like maybe we shouldn't think too much in subjects because I think uh, we're always, you know, in the silos. I would prefer a more um, like fluid kind of knowledge because you can combine math with all other subjects as well with chemistry and physics and show that you know how much fun it can be when applied in other subjects and also you can enjoy i don't know like english maybe when when you do something in history in english um and this kind of silo thinking um, makes it very rigid and not so fluid and i remember that there was some post during corona where people were complaining Oh, I can uh, analyze a poem in three different country uh, in three different languages, but you know, I don't know how to open up a bank account, or I don't know how to um, use an app properly, and so on. So you know, all these skills mm -hmm. that are so key to today's knowledge to survive in the normal day to day, right? Um, yes, yeah. exactly, and prepare um, young people for for life, an independent life. So, I mean, just. Um, just imagine that uh, we should, that that that, um, that we wouldn't announce a math class, a German class, but we would announce like uh, really what you said: um, how to program an app, how to um, how to become financial li um, like literate, and then in the subject of how to become financial literate, you learn mathematics, you learn uh, yeah, you, you you learn all this relevant stuff. And I think I'm I'm talking as a mathematician who has studied for years just concepts. Yeah. Um, mm. there was, in, in silos, right? In it's silos. only math, 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 math. There was little, I mean, yes, I did applied mathematics, so I studied, uh, so there was a link to a medical problem, actually, mm. but really like the math, I, and, and, and the, uh, the thesis was purely in the silo, yeah, um, I think, and this interdisciplinary, uh, I think that would be, that would be wonderful to have like a metrics uh, um, curriculum, yeah, to say, yes, they are, you know, blends of mathematics uh, going into this financial literacy class, uh, uh, aspects of mathematics going into chemistry, Mm. And then we have like, what are the problems to solve, to be solved? What is of interest to me? What matters in today's world? 
yeah, to really like, you know, phrase these questions and then, you know, um, they see the relevance immediately. And this, I think, also makes a difference in our coding camps that they come up with a, with a project they want to work upon and they stimulate the questions they need to solve on the way to, to work on this project. Yeah. So mm. they come up. So actually, I don't know what is Python. Can somebody teach me Python? Because I learned Python is needed to do to implement this project. And here we go. So they come up with what they want to learn. And you have a relevant problem. You can solve it and you have a direct result, right? And that makes you happy again. You know, like uh, success in learning, you, you become you know happier. Your mindset uh, changes slowly and yeah. you start hating math or coding because you see the relevance behind it. Nice. I think um, all your uh, contributions in, in the discussion was so fruitful and um, definitely encouraged probably many people out there to say, hey, let me start learning. Also, let me start talking to the teachers of our children to say, hey, can you maybe not um, do something blend it in here um, who knows what's possible would be definitely interesting to hear but um, yeah before we close i would say a big big thank you to sandra irene and sophia for yeah, being here tonight with us and um, discussing the future of learning and education i found it was extremely fruitful yeah and for those of you if you actually would like to learn um, and you are working somehow in an agile way in an agile company and you probably have scrum um, is this a topic for you um, i would really um, like to bring you to our website netfortech.com slash agile coaching because there actually we're going to have a program it's an eight week holistic learning program where we have a mix of blended learning um, it's um, three times a classroom um, it's a small groups it's called entre nous because it's um, especially for women designed by women for women and it's really around the world what is an agile coach and how can an agile coach help a company to um to succeed and with their projects to do this so um you know, it would be interesting to um to see some of you um as a little side note on what net for tech actually does also to support the career and the development of women and um, agile coaching is our next program that comes up so with this, I would say a big thank you for being here tonight. And um, yeah, looking forward to connect with all of you online um, via LinkedIn or also via Network Tech. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Julia, Sophia, and Sandra. Have a great Thanks. evening. Bye.